listen, I'm going to invite you to come ready. When you come to the house of God, come ready. Amen? Come ready for the word. That means already in the spirit, prayed up. That means on the way, put a little praise music in in your car on your way so you can get your spirit man ready. Amen? Don't come in with the attitude, pump me up now. I've had a tough week, so pump me up if you can. How about I'm coming because I'm ready to be in the presence of God. I'm ready to hear the word. I'm ready to be a worshiper. I'm ready to come into his presence and receive a healing from God. I'm ready to see miracles take place. How many of you with me? Church, let me say this to you. Some of you may not remember back in the early 70s during the charismatic renewal when the power of God was being poured out. People were leaving denominational churches to come to where the Spirit of God was alive and well. And I believe we're going to have revival like that again in the church. So you get ready. So you get ready. And you start coming early because the day's going to come. You won't find a seat when you just walk in. Because there's a revival. There is a renewing going to come. It's going to be called, it's the end day awakening. The last awakening. I think that Jesus is going to allow one more time, one more time for the power of God to move before he comes to receive his church. Does anybody, anybody catch that with me? Amen. That gives you a good thing to pray for. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. I'm going to minister on the, on the theme. I'm ringing up here a little bit. Those up in the sound booth, please. Just take a little bit off the platform. Just a little bit. I'm going to minister. I was fasting and praying for a week. And I heard God speak some things to me. And as we go through every week, I'm going to try to share with you some of those things that God said. Because... He didn't speak them just for me. He spoke them for us. Amen? Amen. He gave me some things to tell you that you and I can line up, that we can all grow in the things of God. How many of you want to grow in the things of God? Amen. Amen. Praise God. How many of you know our little sister? By the way, I'm going to just sideline for a minute. Our little sister, Jessica, she's uh, just had a baby, had a C-section. How many of you know what I'm talking about, Jessica? Well, we family's asked for prayer. She's having some complications. I want you to agree with me right now for Jessica. I want you to agree with me right now for Randy Carter. Randy has diabetes. He's had some surgery taken done because of the diabetes thing with his foot. And we just need healing on their bodies. Amen? Amen. Will you agree with me right now? Amen. Father, we pray for Jessica. We pray for Randy. We ask God for the healing anointing flow through them. We ask God as Randy's in, in, in rehab and as Jessica's at home, God, it'll be the time they can feel your presence and feel your touch. Your word says, by your stripes, we are healed. And whatever we should ask in your name, with faith believing, it shall be done. And so we attach our faith right now with our sister, with our brother. We ask God for your healing power to be manifested. Give them that miracle that they need, that God, that they can be well and be back in the house of God. We give you praise in Jesus' name, everybody said. <laughs> God spoke this to me when I was fasting in prayer. Just a simple thing. And I'm going to try to bring it about where we have some understanding. And here's what he said. We must study and use what we know while we're strong enough to use it. I know a lot of folks, they get older, you know, and they're busy. And we're all busy doing things. And, and, and their health starts to fail. And then they start getting where they're confined to the home or to wherever. And all of a sudden, they get all excited about how much they can study. Well, you know, I think we ought to study while we're strong enough to do something with it. I think we ought to study while we can impart into other people what we've received from God as we're in study. We're told to study. Are you with me? God said we must study. We must study. A lot of folks think they're going to make it through by just impartation, by sitting some beside other people to study. Or they're going to get it, they're going to get it by, by just... Uh, uh, transmosis, you know, it, uh, they can sit around next to a Bible and it's going gonna, it's gonna to go into them. How many of you know study means you're going to have to get into the book? You're going to have to open up some pages. You're going to have to read the Word. You're going to have to digest the Word. We're going to have to find out what God says because the Scripture says in Hosea 4, 6, My people perish. Somebody help me now. My people perish because of some things. Lack of knowledge. 
Why do we have lack of knowledge? There should be no excuse for lack of knowledge in our society today. There should be no excuse. It's on the television. It's on radio. It's on media. There's Bibles laying around everywhere. There's teaching going on in every way you can do it, whether you want to YouTube, whether you want to Facebook, whether you want to go on a serious radio. You can get the Word of God every day. But, you know, just listening to the Word of God isn't all of it. There comes a time that you have to spend time in the secret place of the Most High. There comes a time that you need to focus and spend time in a quiet place with God and His Word. <clears throat> How many of you agree with me that this is God's love letter to us? This is his love letter to his people, telling us how much he loves us, cares for us, and how we can walk in obedience and what happens if we don't. Amen? If you'll be obedient in my word, Deuteronomy 28, if you'll be an obedient, if you'll go walk by my statutes, then you'll be blessed in the city and blessed in the country. Then you'll be blessed coming in and going out. Uh, then all that you put your hands to shall be blessed. Then your generation under you will be blessed. We don't close the book there and say it's all over. That's good. But if you read on in Deuteronomy 28, it'll tell you what happens if you don't. These curses shall be upon you. So we need to understand uh, that the only way that we can understand how to walk in obedience is we're going to have to know the word. Study to make yourself approved. Amen? And so in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15, I'm going to put a little time on this particular scripture. 2 Timothy 2.15. We all know that. We quote it in our Bible college. We use it. And we tell people this is the reason why they need to come to Bible school. In fact, I believe every believer, every child of God, every church member ought to invest into going to one year of Bible school so you can have enough, uh, enough insight uh, that when those other people come and knock on your door, that you're not a door slammer, or a curtain puller, turn all the lights off, run to the bathroom and peek out, hope they leave. That's what, most, that's what a lot of Christians do, you know. And you know why they do that? They'll say, well, because I don't want to confront them. No, because you don't have the knowledge about what your, what your God says as they do, they think they have about theirs. And so they're armed and dangerous. They're ready. Their guns are loaded. They're going to do everything they can to convert you. And the reason why a lot of times we're door slammer curtain, curtain uh, uh, closers and, and we turn the lights off is because well, we don't have the goods. And we need the goods. You need to be as knowledgeable as any of them that come to your house. And we need to stand strong and say, uh, and what I say to them when I open up the door, I'll say, listen, I'm going to give you 15 minutes to tell me what you believe as long as you promise to give me 15 minutes to tell you what I believe. It's only fair. You know, I'll listen to their spiel. I know what it is. Heard it many times. Uh, but uh, we need to understand. That's the reason why I believe every child of God needs to go to at least one year of Bible college. We've had a Bible college here. We started out in a Bible school. We had a Bible college here. We've had it for the last 33 years. And, 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 th and literally thousands of graduates are all over the world preaching the gospel, uh, teaching the good news, setting the captives free because they got involved in a one-year program, decided they wanted to go and get an associate's degree, so they went to the two-year program, decided they wanted their bachelor's degree, so they completed their four-year program, and many of them decided, well, I better get a master's uh, so I can be, uh, so by then they know what God wants them to do. God's already placed them in ministry, and many of them got doctorates and are in their touching lives. Why do I need that, Pastor? Because Paul said to be all things to all men to win some. Is anybody with me? So we need to understand how important it is. And if you're here this morning, you haven't considered our Bible college for at least one year. If you're a church member, that means that you're on the roll here and, and you're a tither. That's important to be a tither because we feel that's part of the investment that you make into this church and we can make an investment back into your life. If you're a tither and you're a church member in good standing, but we actually scholarship uh, your tuition for the first year. You can't hardly lose by going. All it costs you is your time. Well, Pastor, uh, why don't you just uh, scholarship some people and give it to us free? Well, I'll tell you what. We did that in the early years. We would find somebody that said they couldn't afford anything, and we did that. And when it was, and, and 
I'm going to be teaching the Word of Faith this coming Tuesday, this next session. I'm teaching, uh, I'm teaching uh, principles of faith. And I want you to know that, uh, that I'm involved in the Bible College. And those ones that we scholarship and gave it for nothing were the ones that didn't show up for class. They're the ones that wouldn't, that wouldn't take the test. They're the ones uh, that would always uh, wouldn't come on time. Every excuse is good enough excuse not to come. So here's what we found out. When you invest into something, now you're committed to it. You see, you make an investment. You, you put some of yourself into something. And God wants us to make an investment into his word. He wants us to make an investment. So he said, Paul, Paul was the, was the, was the mentor of his son in the faith, Timothy. Timothy wasn't his biological son, but he was his son in the faith. In other words, he led him to the Lord. Amen? Do you know that every person that you lead to the Lord, that you actually lead to Jesus, they become your spiritual sons and daughters? I've got many spiritual sons and daughters all over the world. Amen? And, and, and what that means is we're connected. But we're hooked up. And Paul uh, led Timothy to the Lord, and that was his son in the faith. And now he speaks some incredible things to him. And I'm going to give you those incredible things. Being God said, we must study. This is a word from the Lord. We must study and use what we know while we are strong enough to use it. And be effective with it. It's great to say, well, you know, I just love to study. You know, there are some people that are addicted to studying just like they're addicted to other things. There are some people, professional students. That's what they do all their life. They learn one thing after the other. Always professional students. But, you know, it's okay to be a professional student. But what are you doing with all that knowledge? If you're not doing anything with it to change somebody's life, especially when it comes to Bible knowledge, Amen. And so in Timothy, here's what Paul said in, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. The first thing he said, in fact, I'm going to read it and we're going to break it down. There's four major things that he said to do in this verse. He said, be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, that's a heavy scripture right there. That speaks volumes to me. When I read that, as a man of God, as a child of God, as a born-again believer, I have to apply this to myself and say, have I really been diligent? Actually, Paul tells son, son Tim, first thing he says, be diligent. Be diligent. This word diligent is a heavy-duty word. This word uh, diligent brings in the idea of uh, consistency in the effort to accomplish something. Consistency in the effort to accomplish something. I'm going to keep on going. Maybe I'll miss it. And maybe I'll fall. And maybe I'll fail once or twice. I'm not going to sit down and say I'm a failure. I'm going to get back up and keep trying. I'm going to get back up and do it again. I'm going to get back up and keep going forward. Because one day I'm not going to fall. I'm going to succeed. And I'm going to be diligent to be more than a conqueror. If you study some of the great people uh, that we know, uh, uh, like, like Edison that invented the light bulb, you'd find out that he failed time and time and time and time again. Until one day, he screwed that light bulb in and it lit up. And he was a winner. We all know about the winning cycle. We don't hear too much about the failures. But I'm going to tell you something. Uh, with diligence means you don't give up. You don't quit. Uh, you don't say, I'm a failure. You don't say, I'll try something else. You stay faithful to what you're doing. It means to pursue with perseverance and attention. It means pain-seeking, pain-seeking experiences. It's going to cost you something to get the Word of God. You've got to be diligent about God's Word. It's going to cost you something. Other people can do things that you can't do. God told me after I got born again, I was excited about Jesus. I don't want anything to the Lord. I'd, I'd, I'd win a telephone pole to Jesus if it just stand there long enough. I mean, I was excited about getting souls saved. I was, a, I, I was committed to winning souls. And I want you to know, I realized how important it is that I needed to get knowledge of the Word. I needed to get the Word in me, and I needed to be consistent, and I needed to be diligent, and it was pain. Uh, it, it, had, it, it cost me pain to give up some of the things that I did, give up some of the friends that I ran with. I had to change my whole lifestyle. My whole lifestyle had to change. I couldn't go to the same places. I couldn't run with the same people. Are you with me? 
because it's pain seeking, a, a, a diligent search for something. It's like there in Luke six in Luke fifteen, uh, the woman uh, that lost the coin, and they all diligently, all of her friends came in. They searched and searched and searched until they found the lost coin. Are you with me? You see, we need to be diligent, uh, putting uh, putting your all into it. That's the reason why Paul said, "And whatever you do, whatever you do, whatever some little thing, sweeping the hallway, uh, cleaning the bathroom." Uh, to watching the, some of uh, the children in the nursery, uh, taking care of the house of God after everybody's gone, being diligent. Whatever you do, do heartily. Do with all your heart. Do with everything that's in you. Do heartily. How? As to the Lord and not to men. That's diligence. Paul told Timothy to be diligent, to study and learn the word of God with all your heart. Learn the word of God with all your heart. Get that. Learn the word of God with all your heart. Why? We'll ask the question, how come? Why should I do that? Here it is. Because it will be a lifeline to you through the power of God. It's a lifeline to you. It's my life to know the word of God. It's my life to let Jesus be big in me. It's my life to have the right words to say at the right time. It's my life to be full of what God has. We work hard studying other things. I trained to be a pilot, and I had to, I had to get, go through ground school. As I went through ground school, I had to get all these books and read, and I had to go through all these tapes. And, and back in those days, uh, my instructor, he was, the, he was the private pilot for Jack Eckert. His name was Larry Day. Larry Day was my flight instructor. He's the one that was teaching me all my ground school. And then there was a man that came, came to our church for a season, and he was a pilot, but he was an instructor pilot. I belonged to a club over in Clearwater St. Pete called uh, Christian Pilots Association. And we had a little old Cessna 172 over there that was older and dirt. And, and the windows would flap when you was going down the, uh, going down the runway. But that was our old airplane that we used. And, and I, I trained in that old airplane. And my instructor would, uh, would get me up in the air. And, and by the time I thought I was doing okay, he'd be all over my case. I wanted to quit. I, you don't have to talk to me that way. Until he, until he told me to climb out, and, and I climbed out at about 5,000 feet, and then all of a sudden he reached over and turned the ignition off. He said, this airplane's failing. You better find a place for us to land. And all of a sudden this airplane whoa, starts to go down. And I'm looking, and I'm looking, and I'm looking, and we're coming down. And, and, and about the time I didn't find the right place, he reached over and turned the key back on. And we fired up the airplane and pulled out. And he said, you have to always be ready. You have to always be ready for the unexpected. You have to always be ready to do something. And, 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 to, uh, and to learn to fly that airplane was a lot of training. And yet we think sometimes uh, that the other things are not important. People want to uh, fall in love. They get the urge to merge. and want to get married in three days. Where's the training? Where's the getting ready? Where's learning how to live your whole life with somebody you don't even know? Where's that, where's that opportunity to, to come to the streets and why we have special classes right now with Tony Evans on marriage? And I think every marriage couple ought to come and be refreshed and be renewed because if you don't prepare and train for it, you're going to lose out. It should be just it'd be more than important to learn how to fly an airplane. It ought to be more important to learn the Word of God than to be in the best computer program in the city. Is anybody with me? We'll take time to be diligent with other things. But we got to be diligent in the word of God. Let the word of God come alive within us. You see, I believe that we need to make sure. Make it one of the most important things in your life. Psalms 119 says, Thy word have I hid in my heart. Thy word have I diligently hid in the pantry of my heart. That I may not sin against thee. You see, if we don't know the word, we're not going to know what's right and wrong. We're not going to understand. How many of you know there's a lot of false teaching going on in the world today? That's the reason why these other religions seem to be succeeding so, so much. There's false religions going on that are impacting people's lives because we don't know the truth. Because when you find the truth, somebody help me. When you find the truth, the truth will set you free. So we need to understand. Paul said to his son, be diligent. 
Now, if you, if you get, if I have a highlighter or you got a, a pen, put a little mark on just under that word diligent so you can, it'll catch your eye. Then Paul tells his son Timothy, present yourself approved. Present yourself approved, not to man, but to God. Be approved to God. Let God be the one who puts his stamp of approval on you. Let God be the one that says, well done, thy just and faithful servant. Let God be the one that says, I'm going to open up the windows of heaven and I'm going to pour out blessings that you can't contain because you've been obedient to my word. Is anybody with me? Paul tells his son, present yourself approved. There's a big difference between approved to God and approved to men. We live in a society where there's too many people that want to be man pleasers. Oh, let's make people happy. They can't stand it if somebody don't like them. They can't stand it if somebody, if somebody rejects them. None of us like to be rejected. None of us not like to be not liked. But let me tell you, Jesus said the world hated him and they're going to hate you. You're not going to find a popularity contest being a believer. You're not going to find the whole world rallying around you and hugging you and saying how great you are. Amen? They're not going to sing that song, How Great Thou Art, to you. The only one that we're going to sing how great thou art is that to him. Amen? So, uh, so if you think uh, by being a man pleaser that you're going to win favor and you're going, to, uh, you're going to get good things happening to you, let me tell you, man will leave you down faster than anything else. Just about the time you think it's okay, it won't be okay. We spend a lot of time trying to prove to men, trying to be approved to men instead of being approved by God. He said... To his son, Timothy, present yourself approved. That means in favor. That means God's favor on your life. God's accepting what you're doing. God's understanding your heart. Are you with me? You see, that doesn't mean you're going to be perfect. David had a lot of problems in his life. David had a lot of problems. But the Bible says that David was a man after God's heart. In other words, he had a heart after God. In the midst of his shortcomings, in the midst of his, his failures, in the midst of his, uh, 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 of his fleshly desires, there was something down deep inside of him that desired, desired the best of God. And God wants us to have a heart after him. Study to show yourself to prove unto God. The object of ministry is not to please men. God didn't call you into ministry and give you an anointing and save you and, and give you a gifting so you, can, so you can put on a show for men. He gifted you that you might be talented to walk in the anointing, that lives might be changed, and you might bring people into the kingdom. That's what our calling is. Oh, no, Pastor, that's your calling. No, that's your calling too. It's my calling to prepare you for your calling. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11. And Jesus appointed unto the church the pastor, the prophet, the evangelist, pastor, teacher, the five-fold ministry gift. So you can take this five-fold and take your fist and hit the devil right in the face and knock him out of the way and say, in Jesus' name, I'm more than a conqueror. Somebody with me? You see, we need to do warfare. And so if we're going to be approved to God, we're going to have to understand that, that God has anointed me to perfect you, the saints, so the saints, you, can do the work of the ministry. So you'll get in this community and change lives. And so you'll go into your families and impact them with the power of God. So you'll always have a passion to see a soul and a life change. So you always want to get better in the things of God. That's part of my job. Are you with me? See, we need to understand uh, there's many things which, is, which leads a person uh, to seek popularity, uh, favor, uh, and rather than divine approval. I want divine approval. I want God's approval. I want one day to hear God say to me, well done. Well done, my son George. Well done. You are successful in the small things. Now. I'm going to give you big things. And when we're faithful to him, when we're faithful and when we're approved by him, we'll walk into the anointing. Amen? You see, uh, he doesn't want haphazard people. I'm just winging it. If I have a little time this week, I'll, I'll pray. If I have a little time to open up my Bible while I'm doing something else, uh, that's okay. That's not studying. Uh, that's just doing your daily Bible reading. 
Probably most of the time when you do that, you forgot what you read 10 minutes after you read it. But study means to diligently get involved in it. Diligently pull out the deep things. Diligently find out what God has for you. Be diligent to please God. Having a deep desire to be approved by God in study and in attitude and in action and in agape love. These are important things. Did you get that? If you didn't, I'm going to do it again for you. We need to be approved by God in study. Study to make yourself approved. And in attitude. You see, you've got to have the right attitude. If you don't have the right attitude towards the things of God, all you're doing it is just, it's just you're putting time in. You ever see somebody that they got a bad attitude about studying something or about getting involved in something, and all they're doing is just putting time in? Their heart's not in it. And they're not connected. They really couldn't give a rip if they learned anything or not. God wants us to be, have the right attitude when it comes to studying. He wants us to have some action uh, towards our study. And he wants to realize it's not the natural love that he wants us to talk about, but it's the agape love, the God kind of love. The God kind of love never fails. The God kind of love uh, it loves you no matter how you love back. The God kind of love is there at all times, in season and out of season. Somebody with me? So Paul tells his son Timothy to present yourself approved. He says, be diligent. The third thing Paul tells his son Timothy is to be a workman. A workman who is not ashamed. That word ashamed is a heavy-duty word. I don't want to be ashamed at the end of the day that when God calls me and examines me on my, on my productivity or my commitment to him, I don't want to be ashamed uh, that I just drifted through and didn't put anything into it. I don't want to be ashamed and say, well, God, I could have done better, but I didn't have time. God, I could have given you more, but after all, you know how busy I was. Uh, uh, I don't want to be ashamed to face the presence of God Paul tells his son Timothy to be a workman. How many of you know the scripture says that we are his workmanship? We are God's workmanship. He created you. He placed you where you are. He's anointed you for what you can do. He's gifted you for your gifting. He's called you out of the, out of the world of darkness and brought you into the marvelous light. He poured his blood upon you. God so loved you that he gave his only begotten son. You see, we're his workmen. We are workmen. He says, be a workman who is not ashamed. How many times have we all have done something that would make us ashamed? Don't raise your hand. Oh, don't raise your hand. No, no, don't, don't, don't raise your hand. Just ask yourself, how many of you have done some things that you wouldn't be too proud of? Said some things that you wished you could have took those words out back, but they were already gone. Whatever damage was going to be done, they'd already... Did the damage. Now all you can do is ask for forgiveness or say, God, I hope that there's a healing over that. I hope I didn't hurt too many people. How many of us done some shameful things? Don't raise your hand. And he's telling us not to be workmen, not to be ashamed. But here's the good news. I'm not looking back at the past. I'm not asking you to examine what you did yesterday. I'm not saying let's everybody write down all their shameful things and bring it to the altar. I'm asking you to do this. Set aside those things that are behind. That's what Paul said. He said, I'm going to set aside. I'm going to forget about them. I'm going to cancel them out of my life. And now I'm going to look forward to the high calling of Jesus Christ. Now, from now forward, I'm not going to go down life's highway uh, driving in that little tiny rear view mirror. I'm going to look out of that big front windshield and say, that's my future. The windshield is my future, not behind me. I made some mistakes, yes. I did some things that's unpleasing. Am I ashamed of some things? Yeah, but that's all in the past. Can't do anything about it. But today, I can rise up and say, God, I'm going to be a workman uh, that will not be ashamed to stand in your presence and get the work done and study to make myself approved and let your word come alive in me. Praise God, his wonderful grace. I'm glad I can look ahead and not be ashamed of my future. I'm glad I can say God has a future for me that is a whole lot different than my past. 
I'm glad I don't have to live in the past and have to consult my future about my past. But I can say it's over and done. I'm a child of God that's set free. I'm washed in the blood. I'm a new creation. I'm a brand new man. Old things have passed away. All things become new. Is anybody following me this morning? It's not what we did yesterday, but what we're going to do today. What are you going to do today to not be ashamed? What are you going to do today to hear well done? What are you going to do today to study, to build your spirit man up to where it needs to be, where you can be effective for God? It's today, tomorrow, the next day. Our future, our destiny sets in front of us to be pleasing to him and know that he's bigger than any problems you got. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm fine. I'm blind. Now I can see. Oh, praise God for his marvelous grace. Praise God that Paul said to Timothy, Timothy, I'm giving you this one little verse. You spend your life working around it. You be diligent. Uh, you understand how important it is uh, to walk in the anointing of God. He said, uh, I'm telling you uh, that you need, to be, uh, you need to present your bodies to be approved uh, of what you do. And, and then he's telling him how important it is uh, that, uh, that don't be ashamed. Be a workman that's not ashamed. And then there's one more thing that he told him. Paul told his son, Timothy, rightly divide the word of truth. Rightly divide. Don't get caught up in everybody's doctrine. Don't get caught up in all the false things. Don't listen to everything that comes down the pipe. Because a lot of it's going to be false. We're living in a day that people have itching ears, the scripture said. Uh, they, uh, they don't want to line up with, uh, with the truth. They want to hear things that makes them feel good. Uh, don't tell me there's a hell, Pastor, because I don't like that phrase. Uh, don't tell me that there's judgment. I don't want to hear that. Uh, don't tell me and all the things they don't want to hear. But let me tell you something. The word of God is true. And if you find the truth, the truth will set you free. And so Paul's telling t t Timothy, he's saying rightly divide. Rightly, rightly divide the word of truth. Divide the word of truth. This word here means rightly divided according to the other. Th and this is the only place. This is in, is this in New, New Testament, by the way. It's the only place that, that, that this word brings in the meaning of dividing. And here's what it means. It means as a waiter, as a cook would work in the kitchen. And he would prepare a meal. And he would put all the right amount of food on the plate and divide it up properly. And then he would take that dessert pie. And he would know he's serving six people. He would know how to rightly divide that pie into six segments, all equal. So everybody gets an equal piece. That's how we're supposed to rightly divide the word. We're supposed to take that word of God and cut it up and divide it into the right thing. And be stewards of it. Uh, to be a steward who makes proper, proper dis distribution of each, care, each, each word. And, we, and everybody will understand what the word of God is because we've got to understand it. Is anybody with me? But Jesus said in Matthew 13, 52, he said, Therefore, every scribe instructed concerning the kingdom of heaven. The scribe, scribes were those that wrote it down. The scribes were the ones that wrote down the word of God and put it on paper. And they would have to properly put it in, in proper order. And it would have to be legible. And it would have to be, you would have to understand it. And Jesus is speaking to these scribes. And he said, every scribe instructed concerning the kingdom. Everything that's written down concerning the kingdom of heaven is like a householder who brings out of his treasury Things new and things old. Did you all get that? I'm going to explain it. I'll break it down for you. He said it's like a person that's in the house. And they got a whole bunch of people that they're trying to, uh, they're trying to bless from things in their house. So they bring some new things in their house out on the table. And they bring some old things. You just can't always be giving people everything that's new because they're going to get confused. we got to be reminded of the things that we already know we got to be told and reminded of the power of God and the anointing of God. But we got to be reminded regularly about the blood that's been shed. we got to be reminded of God's unconditional love. Is anybody following me? 
And so that's what Jesus was saying. Hey, you that are scribes that are writing the word, you that are putting it down, make sure you're like that householder that you go into your house. There's a group of people outside waiting for something from you, and you just don't bring a few new things out and bless them, and they get all excited and leave. you got to bring some of the old things that they already know because it's the old things we bring back to memory that causes us to understand and be reminded of the power of God's word and how much he loves us. It's like a pers person serving food at a guest feast, rightly producing the word of God as they would rightly put the food on the table at proper portions and keep it in balance. Proverbs 11.1, 1, a false balance is an abomination to God, but a just balance is his delight. God wants us to have a balanced life. He wants us to have the word of God in us and not be overloaded with, with, with you, you can take truth and take it out of balance and it becomes untruth. Do you know that? There was a lady one time in our church years ago and she got the, uh, the revelation. She uh, got listened to the faith people and she got uh, listened about healing and she really got a revelation on healing. And she believed that she don't ever have to be sick and she could be healed. And she got healed from something and she just went around and told everybody how she got healed. The only problem is if somebody else got a cold or would cough or would sneeze, she would rebuke them and say, you got sin in your life. If you was like me, you'd be well. Anybody with me? You see, that's taking a truth to the extreme. And what happened is she would, she would always rebuke somebody. So pretty soon she didn't have many friends either. She would rebuke me because they sneezed or because they had a cold. Nobody went and ever told her that they was feeling bad because she wouldn't pray for them. She would, she, she, she would condemn them because there must be something in her life that's not right. Until one day the whole church went to the skating rink and we all had a skating party and she was out there just, you know, doing her little thing. And all of a sudden her little thing uh, didn't work when a skate slipped out from under her foot and she fell and broke her leg. And everybody almost was happy to see it happen. All due respect. Why? Because that attitude had to be broken. She had to realize as she walked around with the crutch for, uh, for, for so many weeks and with her, with her cane and all that, that all of a sudden she came back down and got balanced out because after all, she didn't get her healing instantly. She had to walk it through and then she had to start having compassion again for other people that got sick. Is anybody with me? You see, that's the reason we have to rightly divide, rightly divide the word of truth. We know the word is truth, don't we? We know the word is truth. And we need to be able to make sure the idea is that to minister the gospel, we must make the proper uh, decisions and the, and the proper des uh, designations of what the word is really saying and make sure we keep it balanced. Church, listen. God wants he spoke this word to me so we can... So we can have a fresh vision of how important it is to be, to be diligent, rightly divide the word, amen, and understand that, that, that we are responsible for the word of God. It's so important how we handle the word of God. James chapter 3, in fact, in fact I'm going to give this to you, those of you that are teachers. Those of you that are preachers, those of you that teach Sunday school, those of you got your little Bible study somewhere, I'm going to tell you how important it is that you're right on. You be careful not to just throw anything out to somebody else's teaching. And because you like the way they sound and because they're really cool, you're going to use what they have. Make sure, make sure, because here's what the scripture says in James 3, 1. My brethren, let not many of you become teachers. Is anybody hearing me? It's a warning. Warning, warning, warning. Man, 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 man. Are you hearing me? My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. There's many false teachers out there, and we must be rooted and grounded in the truth of the word of God that we can properly divide the truth. My time's up, but I'm going to give you a couple things real quick. The next thing God said, not only did he say we must learn, we must know the word, so that's the part I covered. The next part God said is we must be able to properly, uh, we must properly be able to give it out to, to others and make a difference. Amen. We must study and use what we have studied and make sure that we are effective with it. 
Now, first thing I'm going to say to you, what do we already know? We're Christians. We know the Lord. We love God. What do we, I'm going to give you a few things we already know, just as a reminder. Is that all right? What do we already know? I'm going to take, I'm going to take a minute or two to do this. Number one, God said we must study and use what we know while we're strong. Now let's look at what we know. Number one, we know that God is love, unconditional love. We know that God's love never fails, but we know that God's love is going to be there when you don't love anybody else or don't love him when you're mad at the world, when you want to, uh, when you want to quit. He still loves you just the same because his love is unconditional. In 1 John 4, 7 and 8 says, God is love. God is love. He that loves God loves, loves God. If you don't have love, you don't love him. Is anybody with me? Second thing, we know uh, that faith is the master key to pleasing God. I said faith is the master key to pleasing God. As you're studying the word, as you're learning the word, learn how to walk by faith. I'm teaching the class on, 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 on faith in the Bible school. That's going to be a three-credit hour course I'm teaching starting Tuesday. And it's a course that I think everybody ought to hear about how powerful it is to walk by faith. Because Hebrews 11:6 6 says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. So if we're not walking by faith, we're not pleasing God. The third thing, what else do we know? We know that Jesus will reach down to the guttermost and save to the uttermost. Uttermost means the extreme most. To the extreme height, to the extreme bottom. He'll reach down in the miry clay and pick you up and set you in a rock and establish your going. Only because he loves you so much because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The fourth thing, we know that serving Jesus, we have the abundant life and we're more than conquerors in Romans chapter 8. And verse 30, 37 through 39. We are more than conquerors. We should walk with victory. We ought to be walking all the time by putting the enemy under our feet. We ought to be walking on the circumstances. We ought to have joy in our heart. We ought to be climate changers. But we ought to always have something inside of us to cause us to rise above whatever circumstance we're going through. And then the last one in closing. We know that the tongue is a powerful force that can do good and it can harm. We know that. If you want something to study, study over, over in the book of James. And it talks about how destructive the tongue is in James 3, verses 5 through 10. Proverbs 18, 21 says, life and death is in the power of the tongue. What am I saying? Be careful how you talk. Be careful what you say. In Isaiah 6, in the year the king Isaiah died, Isaiah said, I saw the Lord high and lifted up and his train filled the temple. He said, here am I, a man of unclean lips. He didn't talk about all the other big sins and all the other things. And, and, and he had a drinking problem. And maybe there were people that were committing adultery. And, and maybe there was all kinds. He didn't talk about that. He said, here I live in a place with unclean lips. People talking about things they shouldn't. Tearing one another down with their mouth. The tongue is a destructive force. If you want to study some things, learn how to get your tongue under control. Sister Pat Johnson, one of our sweet sisters that was one of the moms of the church, she used to get all excited in the Holy Ghost when the power of God would move. She'd walk down the center aisle, throw her feet in the air, her shoes would fly up. And she'd say this. She'd say, I don't have anything between anybody. And she says, if you do, come put your tongue on the altar and repent. <laughs> Sometimes we've got to lay that tongue on the altar and say, oh, Lord, purify my tongue. Amen. How many of you think that this word is for all of us? Study, be diligent, make yourself approved. Pleasing God, be approved by God. And let the word of God come alive in us. If we would do what I preached this morning, church, listen, if we would do what I preached, in, in, you'd be so excited you couldn't keep it to yourself. You'd tell people all up, all up and down this community and the grocery store and everywhere else about the power of God. This church would be full in a month. If we would just, if we would just act, if we would just allow the Word of God to refresh us and bring us alive. Amen. Anybody get anything out of this this morning?